I just got a text backstage, and I have a wonderful, wonderful announcement. You'll see it when you look at the side screens. I'm so excited to be seated beside Greg Dowie. I've known Greg for like 41 years to be exact, Greg. We're way too young for that, but I've known him that long. Greg pastors Friend Church right here in Columbia, South Carolina. In the Columbia metropolitan area, there's over a million people, Greg, and it's amazing the potential of what we believe together that God wants us to do. And I believe that God has been getting us ready for 14 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are super excited about this partnership. Yes. And uh, we believe that God's gonna take us together at Fellowship Church to another level. I believe it, a whole nother level. <laughs> so officially, Greg, we are becoming one church, church, Fellowship Church Columbia. Man, we are, are so, so stoked about it. And we have an announcement to make in a couple yeah. of weeks that's gonna be ridiculously cool that's happening right here in this area. Stay tuned, but Greg, we love you, man. We're happy to be joining together our families. And man, the sky is the limit. Go Gamecocks! Woo! Yeah! So at this time, let's give a warm round of applause for our brand new campus in Columbia, South Carolina, Fellowship Church, Columbia. We also want to say hi to our other locations in South Florida, in Miami, also in Dallas, Fort Worth. You know, years ago, Fellowship Church, we, we kicked our church off officially in our own building right here. We started with 30 families 21 years ago in a rented office complex. Ultimately, eight years later, we moved here, so we've not always had this place. The church was literally blowing up. We had a decision to make years ago. Do we either build the American Airlines Center right here, which we could have done, or do we leverage technology and manpower and start locations all over the place? So we began to do that, and it's been absolutely stunning what God has done. So I'll tell you this, over the next couple of weeks, you ain't seen nothing yet because yeah. we're getting ready to get involved in the biggest expansion we've ever been involved in in the history of Fellowship Church. So, so that's just uh, one great announcement. And we're going to even have some more announcements about what's happening in Columbia, South Carolina. That's really, really cool. Well. I love to write songs, as you know, and when it comes to writing songs, I like to write songs that are kind of funny, and we have a lot of girls in my family, and all the girls drive SUVs. Have you ever noticed there are a lot of girls who drive SUVs? Women drive SUVs, and sometimes people think that women aren't that great of drivers. I mean, I wouldn't say that, but <laughs> some people say that. I wrote a song about women drivers, and it's called Woman in an SUV. You want to hear it? Yeah. Ladies, now don't get mad at me. It's just a joke, okay? See, women, here's what's so funny about women. Some of you young guys don't understand this. Women don't laugh at other women. They don't laugh at each other. They laugh with each other, not at each other. Guys, we laugh at each other, you know? Here we go. Here's how it starts off. It's not a long song. I need to really work on it, but the woman in an SUV, boom, 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 boom. She drives so hormonally. Woman in an SUV, watch out! She drives so emotionally. Woman in an SUV, woman in an SUV, woman in an SUV. Now, the ladies are not really enthusiastically clapping. I, I understand. But this joke's going to be on me, so you're going to really laugh at me. Friday, I was in my SUV, and our, one of our twins, Landra and Lisa, were in her SUV. We met at this furniture store. And we were looking around some furniture and things like that. Afterwards, we got in our SUV. So I'm in my SUV. Landra and Lisa are in her SUV. I have a terrible sense of direction. Horrible, horrible, horrible. So I said, I need to follow you guys out of here 
And they go, well, we can point you in the direction of home, but we're going to the grocery store first. I said, okay. So they're watching me back out. And I normally am very careful when I back out. I back out and I smash a telephone pole <laughs> with my SUV right in front of my lovely wife and one of my daughters. And they're like dying laughing like, <laughs> what an idiot. <laughs> And then all of a sudden they sung, man in an SUV, ba 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 ba. He drives so hard headedly, man. In, yeah, yeah, anyway. It's kind of funny, isn't it? You think it was funny? I thought it was. You know, yeah. Okay, and the reason I think it's funny is because it's funny. I'm hard headed. I do have some motor skill problems when it comes to driving. But. Also, I think it's funny because I've been talking about vulnerability. This whole series is about vulnerability. The more vulnerable you are, the more valuable you are. It's about putting the cards on the table. We're only as sick as our secrets. So, many times we're scared to, to, to say what we struggle with because if we said it, people might disconnect. People might do the stiff arm. They might go, whoa, man, I can't believe you deal with that. I can't believe you have that on a punishing loop in your mind. Just the opposite is true. When we tell the truth about our condition, people lean in and go, whoa, you deal with that? Me too. Me too. Years ago, we lived in a neighborhood, and our house is at the bottom of this hellacious hill. This hill was two-tenths of a mile, almost straight up. Whenever I would go running, I knew I had to face the hill. I could either kind of walk up the hill or I could jog up the hill. Usually I would say, okay, I've, I've got to run up the hill. So I would start and I would start running up the hill. And you know when you start running up a hill, your quads are like, what are you doing to me? Your calves are like, you're tearing me up. Stop, you know? But I knew down deep, if I can make it to the top of the hill, the rest of the run, the rest of the 2.5 miles was pretty much downhill. If I could make the climb, then I could cruise. I would always say it to myself. I could feel the wind, you know, blowing in my face of success. Wow, I conquered the hill. So every time I'd run, I'd climb before I cruised. A while back, I did an informal survey. I, I asked people, I said, okay, if you could amp up one character quality in your life, what would it be? What would it be? If, if you could change one thing, about your character, what would you like more of? And I was really surprised at what people told me. In fact, I'll tell you what they told me. They told me what we're talking about today. We've been talking about I'm not blank enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not attractive enough, I'm not relational enough. Today, I'm not. Disciplined enough. Ooh. Are you like me? When you see the word discipline, doggy downer, discipline, come on. How negative. I mean, yeah, I want more of it, but I don't like to talk about discipline. And what is discipline anyway? Here's our working definition. Discipline is simply doing what you ought to do so you can then do what you want to do. It's doing what you ought to do so you can do what you want to do. It's climbing before you cruise. That's discipline. Now some think, okay, discipline. I just buy a new alarm clock, I'll buy a new alarm clock, and, and, and I'll maybe buy these workout tapes I've seen on, on television during infomercials, and I'll, I'll put myself up by my own bootstraps, and I'll have all this, all this stuff inside, and I'll get up earlier and, 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 be, and be more prompt during 
during a, a certain appointments that come my way. Well, that's fine and good. We're, though, talking about discipline in a real in-depth manner. We're, we're talking about the kind of discipline that our great God wants us to have. We've been discovering that, that we're not good enough. We're not smart enough. We're not attractive enough. We're not relational enough. But our God is God enough. We're not disciplined enough, but our God is God enough. All of the stuff that we desire comes from God. We try to muster it up ourselves, but it's a God thing. So when it comes to discipline, climbing before cruising, Proverbs 25 verse 28 says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. If I don't have self-discipline, if I don't have self-control, and really self-control is sort of ironic. Self-control will lead you to an out-of-control life. It's only when I give myself to God that I have true self-control. And this is the kind of self-control the Bible's talking about. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 gives us the secret to discipline. You want to know what it is? So I say, live by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Discipline is what we need the most, but so often is what we want the least. We need discipline. Yet Christianity, Western Christianity, has the West Nile. It does. We go, you know, I, I don't want to climb. I don't want to fight the fight. I don't want to go through the fire. I just want to go around the hill. I want to cruise. I want to be happy and peppy and bursting with love. That's what I want. I want the favor of God. I want all the blessings and the bounty. That's what I want. I don't want to go through what God tells me I've got to go through to get to that. I just want to get to that. Could it be? That's why so many people in North America move from church to church to church. Could it be that's why so many people are just people who chase the blessings? God is a God of blessings, no doubt about it. God's a God of favor, no doubt about it. But to experience the cruise, you've got to go through the climb. You've got to go through the climb. What did Jesus say? You want to become great? Be a servant. Amen. It's about being comforted by Christ and uncomfortable for him. Discipline, self-control is about dealing with uncomfortable situations. But we want the favor without the fight. The favor without the fire. Think about some areas in your life. I thought about these areas in my life. Physically, I, I think we need discipline in the physical area. The Bible talks about physical discipline. Not for vanity reasons, but for value reasons. We need discipline. Discipline is really the decision before the decision. It's making the decision before the choice. It's making the decision you're going to eat clean before the dessert cart comes your way. It's making this predetermined choice that you're going to do cardio and pump some iron before you have the option to get out of it. Our bodies are a temple, a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God. See, it's a God thing. Discipline, real discipline is a God thing. We can tap in to the discipline of the Lord. Because the moment someone becomes a believer, what happens? Jesus places the person of the Holy Spirit inside of our lives. So the Holy Spirit works from the inside out to reorder and redecorate our lives. It's only when we rely, we rely on Him and not ourself. It's only when we die to self daily. It's only when we sushi-size our lives that we trade our dreams our desires, our aspirations for Christ's ambitions, dreams, and aspirations. So it's a trade-off. 
as I delight myself in the Lord, I have the desires of my heart. But see, it's not my heart anymore, it's God's heart. Physically, we need discipline. Financially, we need discipline. The Bible says our stuff is not our stuff. The Bible says our stuff is God's stuff, financially. The the Scripture talks about saving money. The Scripture talks about spending money. First of all, the Bible says that we should bring the first 10% to the storehouse, the church. Not a parachurch organization, not a Christian school, a church, the bride of Christ. The Bible says that. First 10% of everything you make and I make goes to where? The house. We're to save 10%. The book of Proverbs says, check out the ant. The ant saves. The ant works. He's not lazy. And then we spend, enjoy, 80%. What is a budget? It's discipline. And God has given us this discipline. We we climb. We pay now so we can play later. That was pretty good. (laughs) Think about relational discipline. I just said that myself. Sometimes I have to encourage myself. The Bible says to encourage yourself in the Lord. Sometimes I'll just amen myself. I might just say, that was good. Yes. Amen. Yeah. Anyway, how about relationally, relational discipline? We need that, don't we? Discipline. Married couples here with 2.3 kids, discipline to be romantic. Discipline for a date night, as we talked about in our Relationology Conference last weekend. Discipline, singles and students, to live a pure life, to climb before the cruise, to, to, to wait to climb into bed with your spouse until the person is your spouse. We need relational discipline. Discipline to, to associate with the right people. Because if we don't associate with the right people, we hang out with the wrong people, we'll go to the wrong places and miss God's purposes for our lives. Every single time. When I think about discipline, I think about Daniel. You remember Daniel back in the Old Testament? Daniel one of the best and the brightest, Daniel, a bunch, of, a bunch of Jewish people were with him. King Nebuchadnezzar came in, took over J-Town, Jerusalem, deported them back to Babylon, 800 miles away. They were alone in this very perverted and unconverted city. And the king basically said, hey, Daniel, we want you and your boys and girls to eat the way we eat. Daniel said, uh, I beg your pardon. And the Bible says in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Advanced decision making. Doing what he ought to do so he could do what he wanted to do. It was the climb before the cruise. Then in verse 9, God granted Daniel favor and compassion. Discipline puts us into a position to be blessed and to receive the favor of God. But we can't have the blessing and the favor of God without saying, God, I trust you. I know that you're supposed to run the show. You know, I am, I am a great servant. My body's a great servant, but a horrendous master. And you're the same way. So Daniel was a man of discipline. He basically traded Merlot for H2O. I thought that was funny. Traded chicken fried steak in for carrot juice and bean curd. Hot dogs for hummus. How about that one? Yeah. He said, King, after a while, just see which one of us are the most ripped. The Jewish people who are eating clean or the other people. And of course, the Jewish people eating clean were the best. It's for value reasons, not vanity. You think about our physical lives, you think about our financial lives, you think about our relational lives, all those things take discipline. People say, oh, Daniel was the man. What a great man of God. He had all these things going on. He was pure, he was holy, he was this, he was that. Remember, Daniel went through the lion's den, the climb before the cruise. His best friends, 
those asbestos boys, the faithful firemen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, went through the fire. And then they discovered the cruise. We have to purpose in our heart, advance decision making, physically, financially, relationally, spiritually. We read this book, we meditate on the Word of God. The word meditation is simply a picture of a cow chewing cud. You know, a cow spits up and keeps chewing grass at least seven times to squeeze out every nutrient from the blades of grass. That's what we do when it comes to the Word of God. We meditate on the Word of God. We have discipline as we read and study the Word of God. We, we make that advanced decision. We make the decision before the choice to spend time talking to God in prayer. Go back to Daniel, the Dan man. The Bible says three times, as was his custom. As was his custom. He prayed. Discipline. Discipline comes from God. It's deposited into your life and mine when we surrender ourselves. And many times, in fact, I would say in my life, it happens every day when I die to self. If I don't die to self, all of a sudden my dreams, my vision, my desires come to the surface, and you're the same way. So spiritually we need it. Spiritually we need to say too, you know, I'm going to revolve my life around the local church. I'm not going to wait until I have a choice. I'm not going to wait until the alarm sounds, or I'm not going to wait until maybe someone says to go to brunch or this game or this concert or whatever. I'm going to purpose in my heart to be a part of the church. <laughs> Morally, we need discipline in the moral domain, don't we? Filters on our computers, the places we go, some of the premium premium movie channels we have, Hell's Box Office, show it all the time, sin to the max, all sorts of things. You have those channels, you're going to be trolling at night. And it got quiet. Every time I've said that in every service, people are like, ah, 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 trolling at night. <laughs> See, we're taking a God-given desire and using it in a God-forbidden way. That's lust. That's lust. Now, some people... Say, whoa, okay, Ed, I feel you, man. I see what you're saying. I need more discipline. Discipline comes from God. That's the deal. No, it's much more than that. There's the climb. I won't even talk about the climb. Let's talk about cruising. Because the Lord doesn't lead us in a lurch. There's a payoff to discipline. Think about the payoff. Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6, it's not by might, nor by my power, right? If I, try to, if I try to be disciplined on my own, it's like Buzz Lightyear without wings. But by my spirit, it's a spirit thing, says the Lord Almighty. Galatians, chapter 6, verse 9, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we'll reap a harvest if we do not give up, if we don't say, no, the hill's too tall, it's too hellacious, the fire's too hot, oh man, it's just the fight is too difficult. No, 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 no. God has you and me right where he wants us. We should be comfortably uncomfortable. And that's why I'm so glad that Fellowship Church is a church full of us who are comforted by Christ, but I'll say it again, we're uncomfortable for him. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. God has not given us a spirit of timidity. Don't run away from the hard yards, but of power and love and, here's the D word, discipline. The word disciple, people say, oh, how about discipleship? I want to be a disciple. Comes from the word discipline. Discipline and maturity go hand in hand. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. It's control of the self, 
by the Spirit for the sake of the gospel. Self-control. And I only have it when I die to self and say, God, you're the blank. But let's talk about the payoff right quick. Talk about the payoff. Think about the payoff physically. I eat right. You know, I do what I need to do. And Lisa and I eat clean about 90% of the time. 10%, you know, we don't. We have fun, you know. If I do that, it gives me the energy and the health to better do what God wants me to do. The discipline in the diet. Just for example, over the last several days, I'll tell you what I've done. And I'm not telling you this for you to go, oh, it's incredible how hard it works. And, oh. You know, we, we, we love to tell people how hard we work. How are you doing? I'm busy, man. I'm busy. But let me tell you, last week, drove to Houston, spoke seven times to squillion people down there at this conference. That was, that was awesome. Drove back Sunday afternoon. Monday, I uh, kind of got the holy hangover done. Tuesday morning, flew to Columbia, South Carolina, met with the leaders of the church we just merged with, saw a lot of different properties and dealt with that whole situation. The next morning, flew to Virginia Beach, Virginia, did some stuff there, had some meetings there with staff and leaders. After that, went to Kalamazoo, Michigan, spoke at a church there with leaders from all over the north, also some members of the church, talked with the staff, got home that night in beautiful Dallas-Fort Worth at 10.30 p.m. But guess what? It's Thursday and Sunday's coming. I got to write a term paper that's biblical, deep, poignant, where people who have no clue about God or church or Christianity and some have been coming to church for a long, long time. Some are even seminary professors. And I've got to give a message. I've got to memorize it. And it's Thursday? What? So then I do that. And then Saturday night after the service, I meet with some leaders here. Lisa and I do another speech to some other leaders. Then today, I've already spoken once, speaking right now. And then I've got another meeting where I've got to do another presentation. I couldn't do this. Lisa could not do this unless, here's the payoff, of discipline, of physical discipline. That's just me. Everybody has their stressors. You have stressors that I don't have. I have stressors that you don't have. Everybody has the same amount of stress. It's not like, oh, well, he has more. No, everybody does. I don't care who it is. But I'm saying to you, take care of your body physically. Think about financially. Talk to people who've walked with God for a long time financially. First fruits, boom, to the church. Put away 10%. Live on 80%. Whenever I have an opportunity in my travels to talk to people who are financial leaders in churches, and when I talk to our financial leaders here, every one of them is like, they're so positive. It's just incredible. There's like, yeah, let's do it. Let's take the hill. Let's climb. Let's do it. Let's push the chips back on the table. We're fellowship church. We're all about the risk. We're not going to live off the interest. They're that way. I wonder why. It's a God thing. They've been disciplined. It's so hard to write that check to make that transfer 10% to the church. Ah! It's saving 10%, plan spending, and then, Living on 80%, it's, it's, it's just pretty basic. You spend less than you take in. That's the problem. It's a problem in our world today with our government. Just spend less than you take in. It's not that hard. You don't have to have an Ivy League education or a degree from MIT to figure that out. So anyway, that's, 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 that's a financial benefit. Now I look back in our lives and I look back just with Lisa and I and many others I know and see the blessings and the favor of God. As we move this church forward, God is going to bless a lot of people here financially. Think about it. Look at Fellowship Church. This place didn't appear. We've never had the resources to do anything we've ever done, ever in 21 years. 
We're the number one entity in the nation of Haiti that feeds children. Over a million meals this year that we provided for orphans in Haiti. Now, if we didn't have people who were being blessed financially, we couldn't do it. We couldn't expand to Columbia, South Carolina. We couldn't do or have what we have. One day, it'll be like, okay, I have enough toys. I mean, come on, you can only have enough this or that or whatever. What's it about? It's about discipline. Does God want us to enjoy stuff? Yeah, he wants us to enjoy stuff. But it's also about discipline. And when we're disciplined in this area, whether we're making 15000 a year or $15 million a year, God is going to bless your life. So there is a financial blessings that accrue in people's lives. And many times it's blessings that finances can't even touch. How about relationally? The climb before the cruise. Relationally. Only dating people, singles who were believers. Relationally. Setting aside that date night, mate night in marriage. When you're doing that, you're showing your kids, wow, the marriage is more important than your kid's relationship to you. The marriage is the main thing. And then your kids will go out and find spouses like you that have a marriage-centric, a spouse-centric home and not a kid-centric home. This is one of the many, many benefits. And we perpetuate the foundation of the family, which affects the community, which affects the state and the nation and the world. I think you feel it. Spiritually, we think about the church. We think about those advanced decisions. We think about the bride of Christ, keeping her at the forefront. The blessings I see in people's lives who've committed this way are unbelievable. Every race, every color, every stage, every age, pink collar, white collar, orange collar, when people revolve their lives around the church, God blesses. It's, it is the climb before the cruise. And many of us right now are experiencing the cruising. Those who were bold about purity and were built for purity, were hardwired for purity, those who were bold and those who were disciplined about purity, the payoff is, is huge. Guilt-free sex in marriage, walking around with a clear conscience, there's nothing like it. So the payoff is monstrous. So what are you doing? Oh, just give me the blessings and the favor and the, or are you saying, God, I'm willing to do what you want me to do to tap into the stuff you've given me to give myself to you. You control me. That's when I really have self-control and discipline. You're going to take me through the fire, through the fight, and when I climb, I know the cruise is going to be stunning. Stunning. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Oh, I like that. He'll give me the desires of my heart. I love that. But whoa, whoa. But first, delight yourself in the Lord. Then he will give you the desires of your heart. Because see, this incredible exchange takes place. My desires for his desires. And then... Boom. You have this synchronization taking place. You know, years ago, a guy was in his early 30s and he climbed up a hill. And everything in his life said, quit, stop, don't do it. And the hill I'm talking about was a hill just outside of Jerusalem, Golgotha. The man I'm talking about was named Jesus. He climbed. You're talking about discipline. You're talking about crashing through quitting points. He died on the cross for your sins and mine. Buried the climb. Rose again, the cruise. And he had us on his heart. 
and mine because he knew how we could cruise as we're fighting not for victory, but from victory. So, church, discipline starts and ends with God. Discipline isn't discipline enough, but God is God enough. So make him Lord, and he'll take you through the climb and the cruise, and you'll feel the wind of true success in your face. Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for every person here. And if there's someone here who's never, ever, ever said, Lord, I give my life to you, I want you to say that right now. And I'll tell you what we're going to do. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I want all of us to say this prayer out loud. I'm going to say it out loud. Everybody here say the prayer out loud. We're helping those people who have never said it to say it. So just say this prayer after me. Dear God, I admit to you the obvious that I'm a sinner, that I've messed up. I believe you sent Jesus to die on the cross for my sins and rise again. I turn from my sin and turn to you, Jesus. I give you everything I am and everything I'll ever be. Take control of me. May I tap in to your wisdom, your power, your beauty, your relational wisdom, your discipline every single day. In Jesus' name. As their heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I believe many of you prayed that prayer in our brand new campus in Columbia, South Carolina. I believe many of you prayed the prayer Midtown Miami, South Miami, downtown Dallas, Plano, downtown Fort Worth, right here in Grapevine. Many are watching online. Over 100 countries have registered online. I believe you prayed that prayer. If you prayed it, I want you to do this. If you look at me right now, take your smartphone out and text pound, you know, pound your name to 32898. Text pound your name to 32898. And through the beauty of technology, we'll get back to you in a short while about this awesome decision. You might be like, Ed, I want to talk to somebody. I want to pray with somebody. We have prayer teams down front at all of our campuses, men and women, who would love to pray with you about anything you're dealing with. If you want to learn more about Fellowship Church, we're here to help you. And I think all of us, I believe every single one of us, can take our lives only by God's power to a level that God wants us to, to, to live on as we die to self, as we sushi-size our lives and say, Lord, each and every day, I die to self. It's not about my desires, it's not about my dreams, it's not about my ambitions, but it's about you. And I'm telling you, amazing things will happen because there is a payoff. There's, there's, a, there's a downhill, there's a cruise like we can never, ever, ever believe. And you know, I think it's such a great time just to thank God for what He's done for what he's doing, for what he's going to do. We're going to do a song called Rescue, because that's what God is all about. The Bible is an anthology of the rescue.